Welcome to podcast for chapter 10, <clears throat> section 8, and part 1 of chapter 10, section 9, having to do with competition between substitution and elimination. And section 8, we're just going to touch on the kinetic isotope effect. And we're going to discuss <clears throat> a little bit of review of SN2, SN1, E2, and E1 as we get into this. But first, Here's a really nice um, photograph of the White Mountains in New Hampshire. So let's go to the next slide. Happiness is not a luxury, but a necessity. The beneficial effect of mental sunshine on life, ability, strength, vitality, endurance is most pronounced. Christina D. Larson said that. We will first look at a kinetic isotope effect. And this was used in the laboratory experimentally to determine the mechanisms of SN2 and E2 and SN1 and E1. So we're just going to talk about it for a minute here. First, experimental evidence was used to derive the mechanisms that we've seen for SN1, SN2, E1, and E2. That is the rates of the reaction, the relative reactivities of the reactants, the structures of the products. Deuterium kinetic isotope effect is another useful experimental evidence that can be used to study these reaction mechanisms. <clears throat> so what is this ratio equal to? You'll see the equation on this page right here, the deuterium kinetic isotope effect. It's the ratio of the rate constant observed for a compound containing hydrogen to the rate constant observed for an identical compound in which one or more of the hydrogens has been replaced by deuterium, which is an isotope of hydrogen. What does the nucleus of deuterium contain? One neutron and one proton. What does the nucleus of the hydrogen contain? one proton. The chemical properties of these two are very similar, but the carbon deuterium bond is stronger than the carbon hydrogen bond and is so harder to break. The rate constant for the elimination of HBr from 1-bromo-2-phenylethane, this reaction right here at the top of the slide, compared to the rate constant for the elimination of DBr, deuterium bromide is 7.1 times faster. This is due to the fact that carbon hydrogen bond is easier to break. The deuterium kinetic isotope effect is therefore 7.1. Since this number is greater than 1, we know that the carbon hydrogen or carbon deuterium bond must be broken in the rate determining step. This is consistent with the mechanism for the E2 reaction. And in essence, this is proof that the E2 reaction is concerted. Okay, let's now look at competition between substitution and elimination. But before we get into that, let's just review quickly uh, the mechanisms for substitution and elimination. Here's the mechanism of the SN2 reaction. And the SN2 reaction, as you can see, is a concerted reaction because it occurs in a single step with no intermediate formed. The nucleophile attacks a carbon bearing the leaving group and displaces the leaving group. The carbon undergoes a backside attack. This occurs because the leaving group blocks the nucleophile to the front side of the molecule, so it comes in from the back side. Here's the mechanism of SN1. First step, second step. In SN1 reaction, the leaving group departs before the nucleophile approaches. As you can see, we're only leaving. The carbon-halogen bond breaks, with the halogen retaining the previously shared pair of electrons. A carbocation intermediate is formed. The second step 
the nucleophile reacts rapidly with the carbocation to form a protonated alcohol right here. At pH 7, the alcohol will exist predominantly in its neutral form. Since the rate of the SN1 reaction depends only on the concentration of the alkyl halide, the first step must be slow and rate determining. So the nucleophile is not involved at all in the rate determining step. E2 reaction. Of course there are two types of elimination reactions, E1 and E2. The reaction of ethyl bromide with hydroxide ion is an example of E2. Of course E is, means elimination and 2 stands for bimolecular, as you can see from the rate equation. The product is an alkene. As written on the slide, what does the rate of the E2 reaction depend upon? Of course, the concentrations of ethyl bromide and, and the hydroxide ion. What order reaction is it? It is second order. In the mechanism, a proton is removed and bromine is eliminated at the same time. An E2 reaction is a concerted one-step reaction. The proton and the bromide ion are removed at the same time in the same step. There is no intermediate. And now, E1. This is the second kind of elimination reaction that alkyl halides can undergo. E, again, is for elimination. 1, in this case, stands for unimolecular. So, only the alkyl halide is involved in the rate determining step as demonstrated in the mechanism of the E1 reaction that you can see here on the slide. How does the alkyl halide form a carbocation? By dissociation. You can see here the elimination of the halide. What removes the proton from the beta carbon? A base, in this case, water. So how many steps does an E1 reaction have? Two. Which step is the rate limiting step? The first. Will increasing the concentration of the base have an effect on the rate of the reaction? No, because it is involved in the fast step, not the rate determining step, which is the first step. So the first step is the rate determining step and as a result, the rate of an E1 reaction depends on both the ease with which the carbocation is formed and how readily the leaving group leaves. The more stable the carbocation, the easier it is to form. Let's look now at competition between substitution and elimination. Alkyl halides can undergo four possible types of reactions, as you know, SN1, SN2, E2, E1. We want to be able to predict the products of any given reaction. That is our goal. We want to be able to predict the products of the reaction of a given alkyl halide and a given nucleophile or base. First, decide whether the reaction conditions favor SN2, SN2, E2, or SN1, E1. As noted in this table on the slide, S and 2E2 are favored by a high concentration of the nucleophile strong base, while the S and 1 are favored in E1 are favored by a poor nucleophile weak base. After all of this, after all of this, the second thing to do is decide how much of the product will be the substitution product and how much of the product will be the elimination product. Relative amounts will depend on whether the alkyl halide is primary, secondary, or tertiary and on the nature of the nucleophile or the base. Let's first look at SN2E2, which of course involve a high concentration of a good nucleophile or a strong base. The two reactions on this slide show the hydroxide ion acting as a nucleophile and attacking the backside of the alpha carbon to form a substitution product, or it can act as a base and remove a hydrogen from the beta carbon to form the elimination product. As you can see here, a nucleophile attacks the carbon and forms a substitution product, or it can act as the base, strong base, and remove a proton. 
forming the elimination product. These two reactions occur at the same time and so compete with each other. They both occur because the electron withdrawing halogen gives the carbon to which it is bonded a partial positive charge. You can see on the slide the relative reactivities of the alkyl halides in SN2 and E2. Since the primary alkyl halide is the most reactive in SN2 and the least reactive in E2, it forms primarily the substitution product in a reaction carried out under SN2 E2. So substitution wins in this particular competition. An example is shown on the next slide. Here we have uh, SN2 E2 conditions. Of course, primary alkyl halide is the reactant, and we're going to form primarily a substitution product, as you can see. 90% is the substitution product from SN2. 10% is the elimination product. But if the primary alkyl halide or, <clears throat> or the nucleophile base is sterically hindered, then the nucleophile cannot do the backside attack of the alpha carbon, but will instead remove the more accessible proton. As a result, elimination will win out, and the alkene product will predominate. Here at the top, we have the primary alkyl halide that's sterically hindered resulting in the elimination product predominating. And the second example here, we have the base uh, being sterically hindered, and as a result, the uh, one pentene, the elimination product predominating. A secondary alkyl halide compared with a primary alkyl halide reacts slower in an SN2 and faster in an E2 reaction. So a secondary alkyl halide forms both substitution and elimination products under SN2 E2. The relative amount of the two products depend on the strength and bulk of the nucleophile base. So the stronger and bulkier the nucleophile or the base, the greater the percentage of the elimination. Elimination is favored for a strong base, as it says here. And also you can see we have a strong base in this example and the elimination product is favored, 75%. Substitution is favored by a weak base, as stated here. And up here we see an example of a weak base, and the substitution product is 100%. Note <clears throat> that the acetate ion is a weaker base than the ethoxide ion, because acetic acid is a stronger acid than ethanol. So, here's uh, DBN and DBU, which are bulky bases that are commonly used to encourage elimination over substitution. Like amines, they are relatively strong bases even though they are neutral. You don't see any charges. So bulky bases are used to encourage elimination. DBN and DBU are so bulky that only the elimination reaction occurs with a secondary alkyl halide. As you can see here, the elimination product, the alkene, is 100%. Although they are neutral bases, they are strong bases. Higher temperature will also favor elimination because of the greater entropy change for the elimination reaction, since an elimination reaction forms more product molecules than a substitution reaction. Elimination forms uh, three products, the alkene, the leaving group, and the conjugate acid of the base, while a substitution forms two products. As you can see up here, they're listed. The substitution product and the leaving group. Tertiary alkyl halide is the least reactive of the alkyl halides in an SN2 and the most reactive in an E2. So only the elimination product is formed when a tertiary alkyl halide reacts with the nucleophile or base under SN2 E2 conditions. Let's now look at conditions where SN2 E1, SN1, and E1 
are favored. That is, there is a poor nucleophile weak base. As you remember, the alkyl halide dissociates to form a carbocation cation, which can either combine with the nucleophile to form the substitution product, or it can lose a proton to form the elimination product. And you can see this illustrated here, substitution and elimination. Remember, under SN1E1 conditions, tertiary alkyl halides undergo substitution and elimination. SN1E1 reactions of tertiary halides favor the substitution product, while in SN2E2, only the elimination product is favored. As you can see here, SN1, 1, and SN2, E2 illustrated. So tertiary, SN1, E1, substitution is favored, whereas tertiary alkyl halides in SN2, E2 conditions, only elimination occurs. Here's a table that uh, summarizes the products obtained from substitution and elimination reactions. It's best to memorize this table, and you can see it's conveniently uh, organized with primary, secondary, tertiary alkyl halides here on the left, then what happens in SN2 versus E2 and SN1 versus E1? So you might want to commit this table to memory. That's, that's it. Thank you.